Hello everybody and welcome to my Batman Begins lecture series and well I'm really glad that you clicked because this is a bit of a social experiment like what I'm doing here this whole lecture series essentially everything that that this represents is a complete social experiment you know if I post a video on YouTube or, or a podcast for example just saying what are the life lessons that you can learn from a movie uh, a fictional fairy tale you might say um it's such a weird phenomenon that people will actually click on it, right? It's so weird that people actually see some sort of value in these movies, right? Like, if, if I were a cynic, if I were someone who is incredibly, incredibly, you know, nihilistic or, or just, you know, had a lot of doubt, you know, has a lot of rationalistic tendencies, you know, I could literally just say, what can I learn from a story about a superhero, right? You ask that question, but... Well, that's what the social experiment is. The social experiment is, can we, is it actually possible? Is it actually meaningful to take the lessons from a fictional movie and apply it to your life? And can it actually have an influence on your life? And I, well, I hope that it's right. And, and I believe that it is right. I believe that it is right because there's almost no other way to explain the Harry Potter phenomenon, and there's also no other way to explain, well, we'll say fictional, quote, fictional texts like the Bible, right? Fictional texts like religious texts, you know, really what those stories are, are, well, if you think of it, you know, you, you, the cynic would say that these are just stories. The cynic would say that these are just meaningless stories that have no influence on your life. But then you ask the question, you know, Harry Potter or Jesus or God or, you know, Adam and Eve, whatever, you know, do these characters have real influence on real people's lives and have they shaped other people's lives and i think the the undoubtable answer is yes right it's shaped you know christianity shaped an entire civilization and harry potter for some reason has gotten you know seven to twelve year old children to read 700 page books seven of them and then you know essentially act out Harry Potter and want to be Harry Potter and use him as their essential, you know, role model, right? Like their role model is actually someone who doesn't exist, who twirls around a wand, but at the same time, it's a role model. And that's the same thing as the Disney princess phenomenon. Why do all these, you know, little girls want to be Disney princesses? It's because they actually want to be like them. And well, in some, in some sense, that doesn't make sense because they're just fictional characters, but in some sense, just to us, you know, and this is part of the social experiment, it does make sense. So this social experiment is um, essentially a test, and I'm going to I'm gonna be essentially challenging you to, to really, well, respond and really say, hey, listen, you know, I went through the Batman Begins lecture, I went through this lecture series, and did you actually learn something? Did you, something from it? Did you actually take something and apply it to your life? Because the cynic would say that you wouldn't, and the cynic would say that these stories mean nothing, but, well, my hope is that it means more than that, and, well, let's begin. So, um, the first thing that you need, to, you need to learn about these stories is that they reveal something about you, right? You know, the thing I'm doing with these stories is I'm literally trying to take these stories and, you know, I'm spending a lot of time trying to figure out the, trying to explain this to you because I hope that this will actually resonate, right? I hope this will actually resonate in some way. You know, there's a reason why you clicked. There's a reason why hopefully you already watched Batman Begins and you like Batman Begins, right? Even if you didn't watch it, it doesn't really matter. But there's a reason why you like Batman. There's a reason why you like superhero movies. There's a reason why you like stories in general. And the answer is, is because they reveal something about you, right? There's something in you that makes you like this movie instead of, I don't know, Moana, right? Or some, or some, you know, movie that really never took off because it didn't really work that well. And there's some reason why we all like Star Wars or why, you know, civil, our civilization has chosen to like Star Wars, even though it's just, you know, people with lightsabers. And well, they reveal something about us. And hopefully I'm going to, I'm going to be able to extract, first of all, why you like it. And then second of all, why you admire someone like Batman and how you could integrate Batman into your character. And that brings me to my next point. Batman is you. 
you are Batman. You know, when the the actual the neuropsychology behind it behind it, and I don't want to get too much into it, is when you look at Batman and when you watch this movie, you are literally imagining yourself in Batman's shoes. Like it's not like you're a passive viewer kind of like watching the movie. You're actually like we actually do this weird phenomenon where we um where we take ourselves and we put ourselves in these stories, you know. When I'm telling you this story, I don't know if it's true over camera, but I know that it's true when you um, when you speak to somebody. If I'm telling the story, then the person who's listening, their brain waves are actually going to sync with mine, which makes no sense. It's like, why does that happen? But it happens, and it's because we identify, we place ourselves in the shoes of this person, and then we see ourselves succeed. That's probably why in these hero stories, the hero always wins at the end, because well, how depressing would it be if you walk out of there and you say, wait a second, I actually just lost, right? It's not like Batman just lost. I actually just lost. And maybe this was a little bit more real than I thought because I actually thought that I was Batman for a second there. And maybe, maybe it didn't rise to the level of consciousness, but maybe, maybe to, well, the answer is to some degree you see yourself as Batman. The next thing is, this is your world. So since Batman is you, you are living in Batman's world. And I really want to view this story from this perspective because, well, instead of, again, right, instead of watching this lecture series as someone who's passively watching the screen, you could actually watch it, watch this movie or watch this lecture series and say, this is me. And I could actually take these lessons and apply them to the real world. So, um... That's the theory, that's the social experiment, and that's the challenge. Right? The challenge is to see if it actually does help you in the real world. So let's get into it. This movie starts, well, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take it in chronological order because that is the story of the hero. We are going to take ourselves as if you are Batman and as if you are Bruce Wayne, and it's going to start from birth and it's going to end at the end of the movie, essentially. So this movie starts chronologically with um, with Bruce Wayne and Rachel sitting in a garden, right? And Rachel is is this you know um, essentially just his friend, right? And um, well, first let me take you through. So they're fighting over this little arrow, right? This little, it looks like an old traditional kind of like a Native American arrow, right? We could sort of say that. And then he falls into the pit, right? And then he sees all these bats and. Um, and he gets a little PTSD from it, right? So you ask the question, what does that mean, right? If this is you, what does that mean? And the question is, is this you? Has this happened to you? And the answer is, maybe you didn't fall into a bad cave, but yes, this is you. And this is the story of maturity. This is the story of, well, it's the story of the fall. It's the story of the fall of Adam and Eve and the fall from innocence. Well, you can imagine, you know, you see Bruce Wayne, you see Rachel here, and what happens is, they are completely innocent. And they have no problems left in the world, and they are completely, completely, we'll say, naive, right? And um. And well, what happens is, you know, the same story in Adam and Eve, right? Bruce Wayne is Adam, and Rachel is Eve, and um, and then and then essentially they commit a sin, right? They have some sort of problem, and then they fall, right? And it's the same exact story, and um. Well, let's relate that to your life. Like, let's let's see if this actually applies. So there was this lady that I had on my podcast. Her name was Nicole Spindler. She's at this point, she's like 20, 24, 25. So really, really recent. Um, this happened, you know, nine, 10 years ago. And she said she was 15 years old, was living an amazing life, you know, really no problems, great family, great parents, great school, did fine in school, really no problems. At the age of 15, she wakes up one day and, um, and her dad's not there and... She's wondering really what's going on, and she gets a call, and she finds out her dad has cancer. Stage three, um, almost terminal, like really rare form of cancer that, well, it, it, the, the, you know, the light seemed pretty bleak. It looked really, really bad, and, um, and that crushed her. It crushed her. This was her fall, her fall from innocence, her fall from the perfect life of spending time with their family, her friends, all these things, all the, all this innocence that existed. And um, she developed PTSD, she developed anxiety, she developed depression over the next three years mm -hmm. because she wasn't ready. She was so naive. She, she fell so hard that, um, that it, 
I'm not going to say it killed her, but it killed her. It killed her, the child within her. It, it killed the naive person that existed within her because she essentially, well, she fell, right? She fell. And then the, the way I like to think of it, about it is you spend your life on a, well, we'll say you spend your life in front of a well, right? Imagine this is like a well-ish or like a something like that. And on top of the well is a mat, right? And in this case, it's the same thing. It's a... Um, it's a wood board, right? And imagine the the well or the cave is the instability that happens when you fall. But on top, the mat is whatever's holding you up, right? And in, in the case of every single child that exists, right? The thing that holds us up for the, the first, we'll say, 10, 15 years of our life is naivety, right? The belief that the world isn't really as bad as we thought. And... Um, And that, well, life is good, right? And obviously, part of the job of parents is to shelter their children a little bit. So, so the parents also are part of this floor. And then what happens is, almost metaphorically, but essentially, literally, is the floor falls out from under you, right? And you are essentially just falling. And that is the chaos. That is the, that is the fall from naivety that really, um, that really kills Bruce Wayne, you know? And... Um, well, I could give my own personal example with this. You know, I was, we'll say I was 14 years old, 15 years old, again, living fine, really no problems. And I got into a relationship and things were really going great. And then once, you know, a breakup happens and, you know, that's the thing. That's the thing about like a high school relationship or high school friendships or high school, you know, essentially everything that has to do with, you know, developing personal relationships. You think of it as everything in the world it relies on this relationship. And at the same time, you also don't believe that anything could go wrong, right? And we're so blindly trusting as children and we're so blindly trusting as middle schoolers and high schoolers. And um, and then when we broke up, the floor falls out, right? And God, you you really, you know, I, I've, I've had a bunch of um, friends who've gone through the same experience and you really don't want that floor, floor to fall out from under you. But the unfortunate reality is it has to, right? It has to. And... Um, and it's scary. It's scary. But, you know, I, I'm going to spend a lot of time in this lecture, just this first lecture, trying to compare this situation to The Lion King. Because I believe that, you know, there's a, there's a deeper meaning that hides behind these archetypes, you know, these, these stories. So in The Lion King, for example, you have the same thing. You have this divine child that's born that's going to be, you know, essentially The Lion King. And I think everybody, you know, knows this, this image. Then you have um, Simba and Nala in the garden is essentially the same thing as Bruce and Rachel in the garden. Then they fall, right? They fall into, in this case, it's an elephant graveyard. And then, um, well, here's here's the thing, right? Here's here's the next part of it. The next part of it is daddy comes to save him, right? You have your, even though the floor falls out from you, even though you lose a little bit of your naivety, you still have... Um, well, in this case, in Simba's case, Mufasa, in Bruce Wayne's case, his father, Thomas Wayne, to come and help him. And um, and I like that because really what, what's happening here is you see in um, as we meet the father, we start to track Bruce's, we'll say, maturity, right? Because in the beginning, we'll say Bruce believed that he couldn't fall, right? Like there was no possibility that he could fall and that's naivety, right? But now his father's teaching him. He, he uh, says a great quote, and this, this comes on throughout the movie. He says, why do we fall, Bruce? So we can learn to pick ourselves back up. And, um, and that's, that's the difference, right? So instead of saying you're never going to fall, which is, you know, maybe it's not what parents say, but that's what we believe as children because we've never fell before, right? We don't know what it feels like. And... Um, well, now the father is saying, why do we fall, Bruce? And, um, well, this brings up the most important point. This brings up the life lesson that I think you could take from this and the psych psychological metric that we could use to track Batman essentially throughout this first lecture. And it's the idea of coping mechanisms. Coping mechanisms is um, probably one of the scariest things that I've noticed inside of myself. You know, whenever you go to a, a therapist and they always talk about childhood traumas, it makes almost no sense. Like, why would they be talking about my childhood traumas? But the problem is, 
you imagine that you, um, as a child, you essentially ne don't know how to work out things because well, you don't have logic, right? Like you don't have, you're, you're essentially not developed. You're not mature enough. So anytime something happens to you, you're going to, um, the first thing that pops into your mind, the first essential reaction that comes to you is, um, is going to be the thing that, that you act out and it's going to be a new habit that you form. So get, let me give you a good example. Um, one of the, one of the people that I know, you know, as children, what happened is he was the youngest of, of the children. And, Every time it was a guy, and every time we played sports, we would always crush him because every time we crush him, well, you know, he was he was a lot smaller, so it's like you know, it's it's easy it's easy to crush him, and he developed you know maybe he didn't even know about it right he probably didn't even realize that he developed this, but what ended up happening was he developed a coping mechanism, and there are two coping mechanisms. So for example, I had an older brother, and my older brother, I got completely crushed by him every time we played basketball. He was a very good basketball player, and um, and I was very big into sports when I was younger. And my coping mechanism was I'm gonna lose. My brother's John. I say John, we're gonna play for the next two hours, and. I'm going to beat you after one of these times and most likely I'd never win and most likely I'd get pissed off. But then when he asked me to come and play basketball again, actually, usually I was the one who went and played, wanted to play basketball with him. It was just, you know, that was my coping me mechanism. Failure and um, my, well, I guess I was lucky enough to, that was my natural wiring. I'd say what happens when I fail? I actually, I was, I was, I wanted to compete with, with the other guy. What happened is he would get absolutely crushed. And when he would get absolutely crushed, he would, um, first of all, never want to play anymore, right? He would say, this is miserable. And then he did, adopted this mindset of, well, I know I'm going to lose, so I might as well not try. And I'm in good friends with this person as we sort of go along our relationship. And, um, you know, you imagine that even today when we play, we'll say basketball, or any sport, or going to, you know, it's the same thing with school, it's the same thing with everything, it's just a coping me mechanism that was, that was broadened out to everything, where, um, where he says, you know, like, I think it's subconscious, but he says, you know, well, it looks like I'm not going to do too well on this assignment, so I might as well not try, I might as well just, you know, I might as well just throw the towel, because it's really not worth it, right, and it's not a good coping mechanism, right? That's not, that's a natural cope, coping mechanism that he formed, but at the same time, it's detrimental. And through introspection, through, well, things like these lecture series, or through, if you want to go to therapy, right, something like therapy, you go in and you say, okay, what were the coping mechanisms that I developed as a kid? And, well, what do I learn? Like, what, what how can I unlearn this problem? And, um, well, they're more common than you think. That's the scary part, you know? So I had this lady on my podcast. Her name was Katie North, and she wrote a book called Resilience, and she had a really, really rough childhood, really rough childhood, really rough adulthood, you know? And um, and she, she gave me this stat, which really changed the way I viewed the world. It was 64% of children have what are known as adverse childhood experiences. So this this could be like mental mental illness in the family, divorce, um, sexual abuse, um, physical abuse, um, drug addiction in the family, and a few other problems that are very, very traumatic for children. And we could say that's their fall, right? And, um, and well, you got to ask the question, what are the coping mechanisms, right? Like, how did we develop our coping mechanisms? And the, the, the real problem is that most of our coping me mechanisms, that, oh, geez, most of the coping mechanisms that we developed were completely unconscious. And we had no conscious intention in forming them because we were probably, you know, somewhere between eight years old and 15 years old. No, no, no. Well, I'll say between four years old and 15 years old. And, um, and we most likely failed. So, um, let's see. All right, I'm, I'll get back to coping mechanisms in a little bit. But first, let's figure out, okay, so who is this good father? Who is this Thomas Wayne that's going in and saving his child and giving such incredible advice? And, um, and well, he's probably as good as good can, good can be, right? He's the, if we're, if we're going to talk about it in a, in a personality sense, you know, he is the positive aspect of, um, 
tradition, right? So you imagine, you know, when you're when you're a child, you're you're born into a system, right? Whatever that system is, your culture, your religion, your parent, your parents, your um, your tradition, right? And of all these things, some of the things that you have there are really, really good, right? Like the fact that, well, just the fact that as a child, you know, we're tremendously ag aggressive, right? As we as we come out, that's the idea of the terrible twos, and um, and we must get some form of structure. And just the fact that their structure is very, very good for children, and it's very, very good to to grow up. One of the best things that I've noticed between that separates the good college kids from the bad college kids is that. Well, most of the stuff you learn in high school is, I'm not going to say BS, but like, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't get you that far, right? The things that you actually learn don't get you that far if you're going to go into a technical skill, let's say like coding or whatever, you know, but the thing that sticks with you is your discipline, right? Your discipline, your ability to sit down and, um, and work and that's structure, right? That's the good structure that really comes. And, you know, you look at the discrepancy, you know, like if the discrepancy between the Asian culture and essentially every other culture, you know, they're so much more disciplined. They're so much more disciplined and therefore they get higher grades. Therefore they're, you know, well, they were given this positive aspect of culture, but we also understand that there's a negative aspect of that culture too, which is, you know, my cousin, she worked in South Korea and um, she taught in South Korea and she said, the school system works you so hard that you essentially are spending your entire childhood just working. And um, even though South Korea is the number one education system. So there definitely are, there definitely is that two ways of viewing the world, but, um, and of viewing tradition, culture, and parenti parental lineage, lineage, you could say, but Thomas Wayne is a representation of everything that is good from that. And, um, well, I mean, look at it. Look at the society that he built. Look at, you know, if we're saying this is Bruce Wayne's world, look at Bruce Wayne's world right now. Right now, Bruce Wayne's world is incredible. You know, you have right here, you have this train. Thomas Wayne built that. You have the building that the train leads into. Thomas Wayne built that. And not only that, but there's this there's this motif that I really like. It's called, it's called the center of the city motif, right? And, you know, it's this, there was this belief that, um, Almost every church, or if you know they're following the mythology, right? Every church in the we'll say 1800s, right, and going even further back, is in the center of the city. And the belief that it's in the center of the city means that um, everybody is equally close to God, right? And God is essentially the center of your society, right? It's the center of your civilization. Well, it's the same thing with the tallest um, building in your city too. The tallest building in your city is the one that you support the most. So. Um, for example, right, what is the, well, you imagine it this way, on the Washington Monument in Washington, D.C., they say that you cannot build a building that is taller than the Washington Monument, because what do we care about the most? We care about freedom. That is their highest, highest values, and therefore we're going to make it at the top. And not only is it the top, but, um, but on the top of the Washington Monument, there's this little piece of aluminum. Right, and the reason why, literally like on the tip, right? And the reason why the tallest thing in the building or the tallest thing in the city, which is the capital city, the reason why it's aluminum is because it was the most precious metal that existed at the time. And therefore the highest value that you have there is, well, you say the thing that we value most is, well, you could say freedom, right? You could say, um, values in general, right? Just in the fact that, you know, we're picking the top, we're actually putting something of value at the top of the, at the top of the sphere, right? Or at the top of the, what is it? Oh, pyramid, right? And, um, well, that's exactly what's happening here, right? So you're saying that Thomas Wayne, his building is the tallest building in the city. And you could say that in this case, since Thomas Wayne represents a good person, goodness is the, is the representation of the city. And, the city is good, right? We could we could go with that basic standard because eventually Gotham, right? The city is not going to be good. So um. So really, what this represents is the city that you inhabit, right? the The world that you inhabit has good aspects to it, and well, you look at someone like Bruce Wayne. Like Bruce Wayne is, he's brought up in a good way, and at the same time, all of us are to some degree, and um. And hopefully we could sustain that, right? Hopefully after Thomas Wayne dies or after, you know, 
spoiler alert, Thomas Wayne dies, that we could continue this goodness, right? That we could keep our city, which is essentially us, um, afloat. So what happens is the train takes him to this theater, and the theater, mm -hmm. um, well, you can tell that Bruce Wayne has a little bit of, like, PTSD, something like that, and, um, and he sees bats, right? There are people in the theater dressed as bats, and he says, okay, I want to get taken out. They go out to this alley, right? And I'm sure you know how it ends. You have this guy named Joe Chill, right? And, and we're not even going to call him Joe Chill yet because right now all he, sh all he shows up as is a petty, nameless criminal. That's all he is. And, um, right, there's really nothing special about him. He's just, you know, he's your typical criminal who wants to steal a wallet. And, um, well, there's a lot of symbolism behind that, but we'll have to wait for that. So, um... So what happens is, yep, he shoots him, he kills him, and Batman is, or Bruce Wayne is essentially, he has, we'll say, the full fall, right? The full fall from innocence. He is completely, completely on his own. And, um, well, I think I think one of the most burning questions of superhero, the superhero genre in general is, why is it that every superhero's parents must die, right? Why is it that every single superhero's parent must die? And, you know, Batman, Superman, Spider-Man... Um, God, pick any of the Avengers characters, right? Thor's parent, Thor's dad dies, um, Iron Man's dad dies, and, you know, Simba's dad dies, right? And the answer to this question, and I've, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this, and I really, really like this, and, well, yeah, so the meaning behind it is... It's the acceptance of responsibility, right? In a, in a very broad sense. So, I mean, you look at this, this town, right? We have this beautiful city of Gotham. And you were to ask the question right now, who is the hero of Gotham? Bruce Wayne is nothing of the sort. The hero is Thomas Wayne. He's the one who built the train. He's the one who built the, the city. And he's the one who gives to the poor and does all the charity and works at the hospital and does all these good things. The problem is that Bruce Wayne cannot be the hero while Thomas Wayne is alive. And, um, and therefore, once Thomas Wayne dies, then Bruce Wayne has the ability to, well, be responsible for his own life, right? Before you have, well, we'll say daddy came to save him, right? Daddy came to come in and, um, and rescue him, you know? But, but now, when... Bruce Wayne is sitting here in this alleyway with his mom and his dad dead. You know, he's literally on his own. He has to take responsibility for his own actions. And that's one of the preconditions for the hero. One of the preconditions for, we'll say, becoming a mature adult is that you need to take responsibility for your actions. If, for example, you know, you do something... Well, we'll say... We'll say essentially anything, right? Like you do anything that's, that requires the assistance of others, you are not mature, right? You are literally not your own person yet. And um, one of the things that we respect in heroes is their individuality, right? Their ability to be themselves. So um, even though this sucks, right? Even though this, this parental figure dies, you have this acceptance of responsibility. And if, if I were to apply this to your own life, you know, there's there's an actual analytical psych, psychological theory on this, you know. So Carl Jung, he, he's the one who invented analytical, psych analytical psychology. What he says is, in your life, this parental death, obviously, you know, we're not going to say that our parents need to die for us to actually become responsible, right? Like, not only is that not true in society right not only do we have to wait until we're 60 you know because our parents live long um but it's it's really you know it's it's not necessary right so what jung says is if you're conscious about your dreams if you're conscious about um essentially how you're feeling then this death this death of your parents can happen symbolically right it could happen within you and um and it's more of a metaphorical death instead of a instead of a actual death. So for example, you know, the moment that you will say 
stand up to your parents, right? The moment when, you know, you form your own ideas and you say, wait a second, some of the things that my parents said are wrong. Like they're actually wrong. And, um, well, maybe they're not wrong in general. Maybe they're just wrong. Maybe they were right for your parents, but not right for you. And, um, the moment you stand up to them, right? That's like, that's like the killing of the authority figure in your parents, right? Like no longer are they an authority to you. You are your own authority. Or, you know, Carl Jung, he says that a lot of this happens in dreams. So, you know, there was this one time where you, you could imagine this with every authority and Carl Jung, he was training a, um, one of his, you know, fellow psycho uh, analytical psychologist, right? So he's training a therapist to follow his form of therapy. And, um, well, he goes through the training and, you know, he says, you're not allowed to see patients until I believe that you're ready. And the, the guy says, how am I supposed to know that you're ready? He's like, I'll just know. So part of the process is that Carl Jung um, starts analyzing his dreams. You know, they, they have a full conversation. You know, what were your dreams last night? What happened? And one time the, the therapist to be comes up to Carl Jung and says, I killed you last night. Actually, in the dream, I, you know, I killed you and you died. And, um... Well, you can imagine what Carl Jung was thinking, probably panic, fear, whatever, right? Maybe it's some sort of Oedipus complex or whatever, you know, but Carl Jung looks at him in the eye and he says, you're ready for training. Right? And that's the meaning behind it. The meaning behind it is, you know, it's not an actual death. He doesn't actually want to kill Carl Jung, but he kills that authority figure, right? He doesn't see him as an authority anymore. He finds that, well, he could triumph over him. He could beat him and, um... Well, no, maybe not even that. He doesn't need him, right? So the killing of him is just saying, you know what? Maybe I don't need you anymore. Maybe I could symbolically kill you off so that now I'm my own person. And this is what happens with Bruce Wayne. So um, so now let's, now let's bring this back to, to Lion King, right? Lion King is literally this exact story, right? Dad dies, right? Killed by Scar, killed by evil, right? And, um, and God, what a... I remember this in my childhood. Tough scene, tough scene. And well, so now we could get back to one more thing and then we get to coping mechanisms. So the first thing is, who is the person who killed the father, right? The person who killed the father, we look at this person of Joe Chill, what does he represent? You could say on some level that he represents the petty nameless criminal, but that's not the complete story. It's not the complete story because as we know, he is representative of an entire structure, an entire well, maybe he's controlled by something that is larger than just this petty nameless criminal, and that is Falcone. Right, Falcone, right here, right? This is his door right here, and then you have Falcone himself. You know, someone like Falcone, he's the one who's really operating crime, and he's essentially the person who's working against Thomas Wayne. And what happens is, therefore, you know, you could say that Maybe, maybe Joe Schill was the person who killed um, Thomas Wayne, but also it was something like Falcone, right? It was, it was the evil that was controlling the crimes of the underground, and you could say maybe that's the failure of Thomas Wayne. The failure of Thomas Wayne was that he was unable to see the, well, he was unable to fix all crime, right? Because that was Thomas Wayne's goal, to fix crime, and, well, it's a little ironic that he was killed by the criminals that he was trying to help. And now we could get to the archetype in um, Lion King, where it's the same archetype, right? So the, the, the archetype in Lion King is that um, Mufasa tells Simba, he says, your kingdom, right? This is one of the scenes, you know, one of the most powerful scenes. He goes, your kingdom, he gets him to the top of Pride Rock and they're really looking over and the sun's, you know, shining on the city or the, the land, Pride Land, you could say. And... Um, and Mufasa tells Simba, your kingdom is everything that the light touches. And then, you know, essentially saying, your kingdom is everything that I've, I've told you, right? All the wisdom that I've given to you, that is in your, we'll say, conscious awareness, right? If the light represents consciousness, right? Because that's what we say when... For example, you have a light bulb, right? A light flashing, right? That's saying you have become conscious of something. So that's the same representation of saying, you know, when the light flashes, then um, everything that the light touches, you are consciously aware of. But then Simba, in his infinite curiosity, goes and says, what about 
the part that the light doesn't touch? What about the shadows? What about the shadows of my kingdom? And, um, well, Mufasa says, don't look over there. And unfortunately, that is where Scar lived. Right? So Mufasa wasn't paying attention to the shadows. Mufasa wasn't strong enough to conquer the shadows. Or maybe he was just too ignorant. And maybe it's the same thing with Thomas Wayne and Joe Chill. You know, he... Both of these characters were too ignorant to um, to pay attention to the shadows of their own kingdom, right? And um, and that was their downfall. That's that's what Bruce Wayne is going to have to overcome, right? He's going to have to overcome the sins of his father. And um, well, if you watch the Star Wars clo- Star Wars first six movies, if you watch them closely, that's exactly what it is. Luke Skywalker is trying to well. Do the deed that his dad didn't do, right? So, um, well, in the most simple sense, right? I think I think Star Wars is a little bit more complicated than that. But anyways, now we can talk about coping mechanisms. So in coping mechanisms, here's, well, maybe the most important thing. So, you know, you imagine you see Simba laying next to Mufasa, who's dead, right? And you can imagine he is in pure chaos. The ground has fallen out from under him. And this isn't some, like, Well, I guess it's symbolic, but at the same time, it's, you know, he's in pure chaos. And, well, the, the way I like to I, I like to think about it is he was in a boat and his boat sank, right? And the thing is, you can't be just lying in the water because you'll drown, right? You're in too much chaos. And especially as a kid, you know, you can't handle that when the only thing that was holding you up was this parental structure, right? And, you know, um, and your society and all these things, you know, and your naivety, which is now gone, you know, so the thing is, now what do you do, right? Now what do you do? How, what boat do you go to? Do you go to land? Do you go to a boat? You know, what is the security that you're looking for? What is the new mat that you're going to place underneath your well when you climb out of it? And, um, or when you make it back to shore? And unfortunately, right, if we're talking about coping mechanisms, who's there? Scar is there. Scar is there. Evil is there. The person who is going to, well, the person who's going to give him a life raft is evil. The person who's going to give him structure is the, well, the wrong person. So Scar tells him to run. Run away, Simba. And, um, and then Scar takes over a kingdom, right? Scar takes over his kingdom. He says, you know, I'm the king of Pride Rock, which we'll get to later. And now that Simba has run away, he accepts this mindset of Hakuna Matata, right? And everyone knows Hakuna Matata, but this is the full representation. If you want the meaning behind that, it is the representation of the wrong path, right? It's, you know, the, the song goes, um, it's our problem-free philosophy, right? Like there's no responsibilities, no pain, all pleasure, right? And well, he's got a kingdom to run. Right? He's got some responsibilities. He's got to grow up and he's got to mature and he's got to be, well, a respectable member of, well, respectable to himself as well as respectable to society because, you know, this is really his world, right? If we're, if we're doing the simple abstraction, this is also Simba's world. And, well, I think we all realize that a life of too much pleasure isn't, isn't good enough. And trust me, if you want to go through it, I have, well... We'll say that I, I spend a lot of time in college and I've most of the kids here in college are, are going through the Hakuna Matata phase, right? Where they literally just don't really care about responsibilities, really kind of want to let it go and just want to say, hey, listen, I want to have as much pleasure as I possibly can. And well, the problem with that is you're going to have to go and find another boat. And the problem with finding another boat is that you literally have to... Um, swim right you have to you have to essentially well yeah yeah you have to go through you have to go through chaos again you have to go through some we'll call it torture because to some degree it is right to essentially discipline yourself you have to well go through it and it's not easy man there's not there's nothing there's nothing easy about that and that's why i say the people who are in college who are doing the best are the ones who have the most discipline because they're the ones on the right boat or at least they have the most, they have the strongest mat to cover their, um, to cover their well, you know, something like that. So let's bring this back to, um, we'll bring this back to Batman Begins. And the reason why I just gave you the story of the Lion King is because Batman goes through the same story, right? He goes through the same exact thing. Parents dies, then, um, 
Well. So Rachel takes him down. Uh, was this what happened here? We'll say no. We'll say no. So what happens is he um he becomes resentful, right? So if we're saying he Simba chose the wrong path, right? Simba chose this. His coping mechanism was pleasure, right? So his yeah, yeah, that's a good way of saying it. So his mat fell, fell apart, he fell down this hole, and now he has to build a new mat. And what is the thing that's now holding him up? He went from naivety to pleasure, right? And now Bruce Wayne, his coping mechanism was, I'm going from naivety to resentment, to bitterness. Like the only thing that's going to hold me up is my desire for revenge. And um, well, something like that is more common than you think. I really... Let me see if I could find an example in my personal relationships. Because I, I bet you that I've experienced this before. Ah, here we go. There you go. So, I mean, you know, um, I experienced this in my family a lot. Where, you know, in my family, what happened was... Well, sometimes, you know, I was I had a little trouble, you know, socializing when I, when I grew up. And sort of accepting myself into my, my brothers, right? And they were being a little bit... They were a little rough on me, we'll say. You know, they just they just like to mess with me. And um and there were times where I'd hold in all my resentment, like all my anger, and I wouldn't like confront it correctly, and I wouldn't say, like, hey, stop, you know, I'd just be like, just let it happen. And um and then there'd be times where I'd get so mad, I'd get so frustrated, I'd get so angry that I literally just couldn't I actually, you know, there was definitely a part of me, right? In that anger, in that irrationality, you literally start taking actions that cause harm to others. So like snide comments, like, um, well, physical aggression, right? Like just all, all that stuff. I was possessed. The goal that I had, you know, instead of the goal of, we'll say stopping criminals or, you know, whatever, whatever a good hero does. And, you know, that's more of a representation of cleaning up the shadows. Um, my goal, instead of helping myself, instead of bringing, we'll say, love to the family or, or confronting the problem that I have with my brothers, my goal would be to cause harm to others. And, well, it's just a natural human response. I mean, you can see that if you get pushed over too many times, you're going to see that. You're going to see that develop, especially in people who are just incredibly agreeable. And for people who, well, there's a name for it, who get pushed over, right? A pushover. If, you, if you're incredibly agreeable, what's going to happen is you're going to develop resentment, right? And then you're going to, well... Maybe you're not going to want to kill somebody, but you're going to you're going to want to cause pain, and well, that's that's the archetypal villain, someone who wants to cause pain. That's a good way of saying it. So, essentially, Batman turns into a villain, right? Or Bruce Wayne turns into a villain, and he says, "I'm going to go kill Joe Chill because that's what's going to make me happy. Causing pain to others is what's going to make me happy." And I mean, that's the same. If you take that psychology to to a larger degree right to there there are probably uh, there are definitely a lot more steps that can contribute to this but this is the thing that makes someone want to shoot up a school right like that philosophy that ideology is the only thing that will make me happy is causing pain to others that's that's the that's the ideology and um well the first the first step in that is resentment so well that's why it's good to confront the shadow in yourself confronting the shadow in yourself is noticing, you know, not saying that these feelings are, um, not a part of you because every single person has this, this little anger, um, aggression, we'll say evil part of us, but to recognize it, right? One of the best parts is to recognize it within yourself and say, wait a second, I have the potential to be evil. And, um, well, I read a book, a while ago, it was called Ordinary Men, and it was it was a great representation of that. You know, it was it was people who were, well, ordinary men, like 30, 35 year old middle aged men who um, who were you know we'll say like working class who really you know didn't have the best education, kind of like a little bit, and they're educated in well before 19, 1940s Germany, right before World War Two Germany, and what happened was he, they got recruited for the war and. Well, what would happen if your um, if your sergeant tells you, "Hey, listen, you five hundred people, you five hundred ordinary men who didn't volunteer, who just were drafted from the military, so we'll say average people, 
you guys have to commit a 20,000 person um, massacre. Men, women, children, old people, all. Get them all. What do you say? What do you say? And um, the question is, does that capacity for evil lie within you? Would you be able to do it? And most people will say, no, I would never. I would never. That's awful. But I think it was out of the 500, I think it was like five to 10 people stepped off. They said, I can't do it. The other 490 people did it. If you believe that you don't have that capacity for evil within you, if you believe that you don't have the resentment within you, my suggestion is look deeper. It's not It's not that you just don't have it because, well, you can see, I think, I think one of the funniest examples of this being well socialized, right? This being used in a, in a positive way, this, this instinct for resentment is sports rivalries. Right in sports rivalries, I'm a Giants fan. I hate the Jets. I really hate the Jets. I really hate the Cowboys. And um, well, I bet you some people just got pissed at me. But anyways, you know, throughout my childhood, that tribalistic, you know, resentful. Um, well, I resented the Patriots. I'll tell you that much. But you know, the tribalistic, um, bitter, and we'll say aggressive parts of me were well socialized in an innocuous manner, such as sports. And, um, and rivalries and, you know, you know, like I, I have friends who are Cowboys fans and you, you don't really hate the person who's a Cowboys fan, but you, you have this fun rivalry, which ends up happening. And that's, that's a well-socialized evil that lies within you. You're essentially taking the evil and just, well, converting it into something that's innocuous, right? Instead of just completely repressing it. And then it emerges, right? Like a, like bottling up these, these rageful emotions that I had with my brothers. And then eventually it all just spurts out, you know, it's real. It happens. So, uh, this Joe chill, um, trial happens and well, it's really, it's a spit in the face of, of Bruce Wayne, because what happens is, you know, you look at someone like Joe chill and there's a huge difference between what he looked like before and what he looks like now, right? Let me see if I can pull up a picture, right? Like he looks so much better than this, well, we'll call him petty criminal, right? And, um, and he actually looks rehabilitated, right? He actually looks like he's, he's better. And, um, well, Batman still wants to kill him. Right, of course, or Bruce Wayne still wants to kill him because he's resentful, right? He, the only thing he says that's going to make him feel good is killing this person, right? Because this man has caused me so much pain, I might as well cause as much pain as I can to him too. And, well, isn't that an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, right? Isn't, isn't that the same philosophy? Like, it's not something that's so abstract. And, um, well, here's the right way of doing it, we'll say. So what this, this, is, a, um, this is a clip from The Karate Kid. I think it's the Karate Kid 2. It happens like right, it's like the first scene of Karate Kid 2. And if you haven't seen Karate Kid, this is Mr. Miyagi. And Mr. Miyagi's like the, the wise spiritual man. And the guy on the right is the, uh, we'll say the evil, yeah, the evil karate leader who trains his guys to be bad. He's the head of the Cobra Kai Dojo. And he trains all of his kids to essentially just do violence, right? To be like reckless and just, cause as much pain as possible, essentially. And um, so Mr. Miyagi uh, gets into a fight with this guy, which, you know, he does it for, Mr. Miyagi does it for a virtuous reason, because of course he's essentially the perfect character. And um, and he wins, right? And Mr. Miyagi has this chance to cause pain to um, to the head of the Cobra Kai Dojo, this, this evil man. And, um, and essentially he's got the guy on his knees and he's got the, He's got like his hand over him and he can essentially like knock him out essentially. And, um, and he doesn't, right? He just lets him go and he just lets him walk away. And Daniel, right? His, his essential like Padawan learner says, why didn't you hurt him? And you know, why didn't you do the eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, right? <clears throat> Especially after, um, you know, the, the evil deeds that he did, right? And he says, Mr. Miyagi says, because Daniel son, <clears throat> I'm sorry. This is because Daniel son, for a person with no forgiveness in his heart, living is an even worse punishment than death. So what he's really saying is resentment. The problem with resentment is that it resides in you, right? If you don't forgive 
then you're literally just not forgiving. Well, who's the person who's receiving harm from it? Clearly, it's not Joe Chill because he's doing fine. He's gone through the, well, the struggle of forgiving himself and going through this giant, you know, well, rehabilitation process. But the person who hasn't healed is Bruce Wayne. So, um, well, <laughs> it's funny because the answer is to why you should forgive is, it seems like to some degree, self-interest. But anyways, I think, that, I think that's a funny thing. But, <clears throat> but then he becomes resentful and, well, he doesn't get his shot. He doesn't get his shot. And that's one of, well, that's, that's something ironic. You know, I think that, um, I think it was Falcone who killed him, right? Or, or one of Falcone's pawns. And, um, well, you asked the question, like, if he got his vengeance, would he actually be satisfied? I think we all know the answer is no. So, um, so right after that, he hangs out with Rachel and Rachel is essentially, you know, so we find out that Rachel has picked the right path. She's doing a great job and she's essentially, well, she's Nala, right? If we're going in the Lion King sense, like they're the same exact character, the strong, fiery, um, supportive, but also judgmental person who is in favor of justice, right? And, um, well, they get in, you know, she sees who he, who he's become, right? She starts to figure it out. And, um, well, well, I think there's, there's a good part here. You ready? So she sees who he's become, you know, a little cocky, a little resentful. And she says right here, she goes, you know, you see this little face that she's giving. She's like, if you want to actually go and, well, stand up to your enemy, don't stand up to Joe Chill. Stand up to the person who's still causing crime. And um, and that's Falcone, right? That's Falcone. And she says, go in and do it. And Batman says, or Bruce Wayne, I'm sorry. He says, um, I'm not one of your good people, Rachel. I'm not one of your good people. I don't, I don't. I don't do things because I want to see good happen. Well, so what happens is she gives him a little nudge and she says, all right, you think you're so tough, you know, go in and take him. And, um, and well, if we're going to, if we're going to talk about this in terms of the, the Lion King movie, right? This is the exact same moment at the literal end of the Lion King movie. That's the moment where Simba confronts Scar, right? Where Simba comes in and he says, you know, you have Nala coming here and saying, Hey, listen, um, you should go and fight Scar and that's it, right? Be a man essentially and go and do it. And, um, and you know, like it's that easy, but anyways, so she goes in and, um, and he says, he goes, Hey, listen, listen, I'm not one of your good people, Rachel, right? Like I'm not, I'm not one of those people that's going to stand up to the bad guys. And well, essentially saying I'm not my father, right? Like don't compare me to my father. And what she says is her, your father would be ashamed of you, right? There's like that. Well, it makes sense, right? Because obviously he's not acting out in the way that his father should. And it's the same thing in The Lion King. The Lion King. Uh, Simba says this. He goes, you know, you're starting to sound like my father. And then she goes, at least one of us does. Right? And you could say Nala and Rachel are essentially the same character. And um, and she's shaming him. Right? She's shaming him, telling him, hey, listen, you are not the person that you should um, that you should be. Because your father was a good man. Like, don't, don't get that confused. Like, your father was a good man. And he had so much good to him. Even though he had his flaws. And even though you're rejecting that part of you. Even though you're set... You're, say, in a rebellious adolescence phase, or at least you chose the wrong path, right? Like, like we, we can't deny that Hakuna Matata, as well as, you know, just this annoying, stupid little Bruce Wayne face is um is choosing the wrong path. And, you know, that's okay, right? Like, that's, that's really not a terrible thing. But at the same time, it's like, well, choose the right path, right? Choose the right path. At least, you know, the, the way that I explained it in The Lion King is that, like, you know, Mufasa was here. Right? And um and Simba's down here right now. It's like to be able to get past Mufasa, which hopefully is the goal, right? Hopefully he ends up beating Scar and beating Mufasa and becoming a better king than Mufasa ever was, because hopefully that's the goal throughout generations. But uh, but for you know, you gotta you gotta at least accept Mufasa's rules because Mufasa had some good in him. You know, there was there were a lot of good things that happened that came from Mufasa. So you can't you can't reject, we'll say, if Mufasa or Thomas Wayne is a symbol of for, 
for tradition, for culture, you know, of, um, of the lessons you learned as a kid, you know, some of the valuable integrations into society that you were given, you know, it's like, you, you could still use those, even though some of them were bad. So well, that's what happens in the Lion King. He f essentially finds Scar, takes down Scar and wins, right? And, you know, he has this little moment moment where he has this, like, revelation and um, and his father comes back to him. He says, remember who you are. And um, and Simba essentially, like, controls or becomes Mufasa and then exceeds him, right? And that's, that's the end of The Lion King, right? You get to the end of The Lion King. But you realize, wait a second, we're only about 15, 20 minutes into Batman Begins. And this is why I like Batman Begins. So what happens is... Um, so Bruce Wayne has the same essential like realization where he takes the gun that he was going to that he was going to use he takes the resentment that he had this rejection of tradition this rejection of culture this rejection of society in general right and he takes it and he throws it into the river right? and he says I'm done with it symbolic great moment right it's the moment of maturity you could say right like actually you know there's something good in rejecting authority because you know well, children and adolescents, and I definitely have this nature of trying to reject authority, which, hey, listen, like, it's great. But there's also the, there's also got to be that other part of me where I literally go and I say, hey, but wait a second. The people of the past have already kind of figured out so many things. Like, I've only been on this earth for, what, like, 19, 20 years? You know, like, people have been on this earth for the last 200,000 years. And maybe maybe they've learned something that I don't really want to spend the, the rest of my lifetime trying to learn. It's like, you know, how wonderful, how wonderful is it that we have indoor plumbing? It's like, imagine a world where you had to figure that out for yourself. You wouldn't be able to progress past indoor plumbing because you were stifled with such a problem of indoor plumbing and, you know, an economy and building up economic systems and buildings and, and, you know, well, killing animals, right? Like the fact that food is just kind of given to us is something that we just sort of take for granted. And that's what Bruce Wayne was doing. He was just taking it for granted. But at the same time, you got to at least give a little bit of respect for the culture that, that you were born in because, well, if not, you'd have to start from zero. You know, there's, imagine, well, a lot of a lot of the theory that I use is based on evolution. You know, evolution is literally just the basic theory that all science rests on. And imagine if ev evolution wasn't there, right? Imagine if we didn't have someone like Charles Darwin, then we wouldn't be able to explain some of the things that happen in this world, and we don't have a lens to look through it. So, you know, if if you just if I just listened to my rebellious part of me, that adventurous part of me that wants to essentially just go my own way, then I would just completely reject. Darwin's theory and say tradition's stupid, Darwin's stupid, evolution's stupid, and um, and I'd have to essentially figure it out for myself. But I think we realize that there's something valuable in not having to figure it out for yourself, just kind of understanding it, not going through the 30 years that Darwin had to do it, plus some crazy, crazy like flashes of inspiration along with spending time in the jungle and um, just to come to a, a realization that could take me about maybe like. 10 minutes to learn from a crash course, you know, it's, it's nice. It's nice. So, um, Batman has this moment. He has this realization where he says, Hey, listen, um, I'm going to, I'm going to accept tradition. I'm going to accept, um, my father. I'm going to accept, well, a little bit, but he says, uh, yeah, yeah. He says, I'm going to accept my father. And I'm also going to accept, um, the, the heroicism that my father had. So, what does he do? He essentially confronts Scar, right? It's the same thing. He goes into this alleyway and he says, hey, listen, I'm going to go up to him. I'm going to confront him head on. And this is the point where Simba wins, right? This is the point where Simba literally wins. And he goes there. He sees Falcone. And um, I like I like the character of Falcone. He's very like Godfather-esque, right? Like that's sort of a good way to describe him. He's just like the mob boss who, you know, he's not just like the the reckless animalistic criminal right like a like a voldemort i find voldemort you know um voldemort's a good example like i guess kind of like planet of the apes but like scar right these traditional crim or darth vader right all these most of those criminals are literally just you know greed power money that's really all i care about but but you know falcone's a little bit more sophisticated which which is nice and um, he really fits the bill of someone who's calculated and evil, just like Scar was, right? So what he's really doing is confronting this, you know, we'll say, egotistical version of himself. And um, 
<laughs> he gets punched in the face. He gets punched in the face, right? Like, this would be the end of Lion King. This would be the end of um, Simba confronts Scar, and Simba wins, and wow, what a great experience. But Batman just, Bruce Wayne just gets punched in the face. And, um, and yeah, it's like, you know, how are you, you know, I think in, in that sense, Lion King is somewhat naive because it just, you know, well, essentially you go through the entire Lion King and there's about 30 seconds of him going through what is known as like the trials and tribulations of like, you know, which we'll get into later, which is literally just the process of growing yourself and becoming a better person and, and honing your skills and going deeper into yourself. For that, it's like 30 seconds in The Lion King. For this movie, it's about an hour, <laughs> which, which is when he meets Ducard and all these things. So, you know, it's, um, well, well, this, this movie is a little bit, it's like a, it's like a step into reality of saying, wait, listen, you, you come to this momentary realization in The Lion King, right? This moment where you're like, oh my God, I understand, you know, but maybe when you actually face the real world, the world's a little bit more complicated than that. And Falcone says it, he points over and he says, look at this judge over here, right? The little blonde guy with the two women there. And, um, I'm not going to say the little blonde guy cause he's huge. And, um, and he says, that guy right there is a judge. He's a government official. He's under my he's under my watch. He's on my side. You know, we have we have cops, judges, government officials, as well as, you know, essentially every single piece of the establishment, right? The people who are supposed to be the good guys. I have them under my control. And if you think you could just come in here and just say that you're the you're the best, right? Say that you're the guy who's the messiah and just gonna figure it out right away with no help, with no skills, with no nothing, then you're you're stupid. And um well, that's about right. That's about right. You know, there's the path of the entrepreneur, which, you know, I take the path of, but you could, you could talk about this in sort of every single domain, right? Like think about it in your relationships. It's like, you know, across, well, for, for entrepreneurs and relationships, you are going to fail multiple times. There's going to be a tremendous amount of failure that comes in. And, um, and it's brutal. It's brutal. Like you think that after one time, one failure, one failed business, one failed relationship, one failed whatever, right? Like whatever it is, you know, you know, I think it takes an average smoker seven times to quit. You think after one try, it's going to be like, yes, I got it. But it's really, really not that simple. And, um, and it's naive. It's naive, and that's what happens with Bruce Wayne. He just says, hey, listen, you know, I, I believe that I am going to be the best, and I am going to really figure it out, and um, I could do it in one swift blow, and then my problems will be over, and that's sort of the end, but it's it's the naive way of viewing the world. You know, I, I, I did that so many times when I was a kid. I would say, um, we'll say young adolescent, right? This is probably like middle school, high school, and I'd come in, and I'd say, okay, I want to work out right? And if I just do it, if I just figure it out now and I establish a good habit, which probably I estimate it would take like one or two weeks, you know, one or two weeks of hell, let's say, then, then I don't have to worry about it again. I really don't have to worry about it for the rest of my life. And, um, and that's the end of this problem. Then I have, then I have the workout problem solved. And it's like, really, really, you know, you know, the amount of people that work out for like 10 years. And then, you know, during quarantine, what happens is they literally just can't make it to the gym. So then they stop working out for like three months, and then they just can't find their way back. You know, I've, I've had multiple friends who've had that experience. It's like, maybe the maybe the problem is that I expected that problems would go away, when really problems just persist throughout your whole life. And you just have to keep adjusting with the times you have to keep um fending off these problems and that's and you have to be strong enough right you have to maintain the strength to be able to push through and um right that's what joe rogan says he says every morning when i wake up to go and run which he does every morning um about 50 percent of the time it's crappy it's awful right i get up and i'm like i really don't want to do this i don't want to go through it it's miserable like why would i want to go out and run to get back to the same spot you know, just run, essentially take a few laps around the block, you know, like evolutionarily, it's so stupid that we run, but at this, because usually when evolutionarily you, you run to find food, you run to, you know, get water, you run away from predators. You don't run to just get back to the same spot where you were just to burn calories. It's stupid. But, um, 
but he says he doesn't. Right? You just you have, you have to push through and you have to keep fighting every single morning. It's not it's not one of those things where you can just eliminate problems and that's the end. So um so that was Batman's problem. That was um Bruce Wayne's problem. He was naive. And then um well you realize that maybe maybe the the problem not only deals with Falcone, it deals with literally every single element of the system. I mean you look at this, you have Mr. Earl who has taken over um who has taken over Wayne Enterprises. He's essentially evil, right? He just cares about profit and greed and money. You can think of him as like a as like a Darth Vader character who literally just wants to make as much money as possible and well, he's definitely not carrying on the Wayne legacy. He has to, you know, Batman's got to deal with that. And then you have this guy on the right, his name, right? That's Rachel on the left. And you have this guy on the right, Mr. Crane, who's also, um, Dr. Crane is also Scarecrow, who's essentially, you know, he's essentially representative of the evil that exists within society. And he's trying to essentially poison all the citizens, which, and, and he gets everybody out of jail, right? Like, um, like Rachel is essentially powerless against this guy. And then you have one more guy who, you know, well, if you've watched this movie, then you know who it is, but he's the one who essentially orchestrates the entire thing. And, you know, well, Batman realizes that this Falcone guy maybe, maybe might not be the, um, might not be the biggest problem, right? He might not be the, be the, be the, be, he might be just a little small microcosm of the problem. He isn't Scar. Literally, the entire system is Scar. It's consistent of multiple Scars that are a lot more complex, and maybe the Lion King was a little naive in that way. And that's what Falcone does. Falcone goes up to him, and he says, Hey, listen, man. He goes, Just because your mommy and daddy got shot, um, you think that you're, you think that, um, that you deserve some sort of righteousness and that you're the best. He goes, Hey, listen, you're the Prince of Gotham. You have no idea what it's like, right? When he says Prince of Gotham, he says, you're royalty. You're a, you're a trust fund baby. And, um, and you have no idea what it's like to, to be a criminal, understand criminals, understand underground society, and also to know what evil is because you literally have never dealt with that in your entire life. So well, we get to the end of this, you know, so the, the same, so here's the archetype, right? We get to the same exact point in Lion King and Batman, right? The same exact storyline. And by the end, one of them emerges victorious. Simba emerges victorious. And he um, essentially achieved all of his dreams and takes back the lion, uh, the kingdom and blah, blah, blah. Batman comes in, goes through the same exact storyline and says, maybe I'm naive. Maybe I have a lot more work to do. And I think that's the point that is a little bit more realistic. And at the same time, it is, well, there are two potential paths, right? Like the, may, maybe the path is, maybe if you want to start, let's say, cleaning up your room, right? Something small. Then maybe you might need the Lion King path, right? The Lion King path, which is, you know, pretty easy and doesn't require that much struggle. But for, you know, we'll say fixing the resentment that lies within you or fixing an entire system of corruption that exists within your mind, within your society, within your world, which is essentially the process of adolescence, maturity, and trying to figure out who you are, which is a lot more complex than just cleaning your room. You got to go through path two. And you, you're going to, you're going to realize among so many of these paths, you know, um, along so many of these journeys that you're incredibly naive and that you, well, that's gonna take a lot more work than you expected. And the, and the idea of, of getting rid of problems is never gonna be the case. You're gonna to have to be strong enough maybe to face the problem. And that's, that's the essential archetype that you get from that. So that's good for now.